Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's so great to be here, um, particularly in this very important month for women. Um, and we have an incredible lineup of numerous women doing um, really wonderful work in their sectors. Joining me in just a moment will be Jill Singer. Jill is Vice President of Defense and National Security for AT&T's Public Sector and FirstNet. Um, we're going to have a wonderful conversation about her life story and what led her to the work that she's doing today. Um, as always, we'll have a segment from Sherry Marson, our Lifestyle Watch contributor. And this week, Sherry's going to be chatting with Michelle Fishburne. Michelle is a, a an author, but she's also um, what she describes as a corporate nomad. And she's traveling the world um, in an RV while she's doing the work that she needs to do. So it's going to be an interesting segment with her. You'll also hear from Carol Eggert. Uh, for our Military Watch, Carol Eggert is Senior Vice President of Military and Veterans Affairs for Comcast, NBC Universal, and you'll see a beautiful spot from uh, Madeline Bell's Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as well. So now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show, Jill Singer. Hello. Happy Hello. International Women's Day. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Yeah, it's a great day to have you on. But of course, we know every day really should and is Women's Day. Um, Absolutely. Yes. But I'm glad we have a specific day that we should all celebrate ourselves as well as all the other amazing women who are across the world, but in our lives. Yeah, I agree. And we see so, you know, if you log on today across social media, there's so many beautiful quotes and history and typically stories that we've never heard of, you know, of women that have done things um, in history and not really gotten their dues. So I love that. Yeah, I agree. We uh, we certainly have a lot of history that we learn through school that happens to be uh, less dominated by women. So uh, perhaps that's a, a journey we need in the future, uh, proposing and proselytizing more uh, women-dominated history. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so thrilled. I'm always thrilled when I have a woman on that is doing work that has historically been male-dominated, and that's certainly the case for you. Um, but as always, we're going to start uh, with your background and, and find out where you came from. Um, and I wanted to open this show with a quote. Um, we had a previous conversation and you said, I was a little girl who didn't come from much, but was smart and landed in a leadership position with the help of professors and mentors guiding my journey. Um, and I love that quote because um, it speaks to what we talked about um, being that kind of academically bright young girl, uh, but as you described, nerdy, but cool. <laughs> well, so I you, think anyway. <laughs> yeah, I love the way you describe that. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what, where did your confidence come? Where did it develop in you as a young girl that allowed you to pursue a field so um, historically male dominated? Well, you know, confidence, I think, is something that comes from within an individual, but is nurtured by the environment that the individual uh, finds themselves in every day. Uh, and I would say, um, it, you know, probably early on, recognize that there was some uh, academic excellence in there. It, I mean, you get that when you're in kindergarten and you start uh, with those activities or when you read at three or, or other things, you recognize that there's an aptitude or your parents 
generally or your teachers recognize there's an aptitude there and their job is to sort of nurture that aptitude so that it uh, so that it fuels the confidence from within uh, your own self. Um, I I would probably say I felt like a pretty confident individual for a long time. Uh, whether I was good at showing that in, uh, in the right ways, uh, don't know, but I certainly did find that one way I could show it was uh, as a, as a young person was through my report cards and right. making yes. sure that those report cards were uh, something about which I was proud, but also something that I thought, um, showed the confidence I had in myself to get through my academic studies. Yeah, by the way, you were the uh, first in your family to go to college. Mm -hmm. So were your parents really instilling in you the importance of education? Was that something they were um, speaking to you about? Um, well, it, so yes, of course, I was the first to go to college, but the youngest in the family. So there wasn't uh, there wasn't a good track record or a good history or a role model there of you just go to college from a family perspective. Um, my parents just didn't have the opportunity uh, to go to college. Uh, and part of that is generational and part of that is their upbringing. I would not say that my parents were right there saying, well, when you go through college <laughs> or when you graduate from college, but they were very encouraging of my academic pursuits. You know, they were, they were there to support me in any way that they could. Uh, and I would also say they were there uh, to tell me that I could be anything I wanted to be. It, it would take work, it would take effort, but there was nothing that was going to hold me back and I, I certainly don't remember them ever saying, "Well, you might be able to do this, but you're a but you're a girl." Uh, that was that was not a kind of talk that happened uh, in our house. So I, you know, ultimately I'd say going to college was uh, something I always thought I'd do from as long as I could remember a thing called college existed. And I do think it was something that my parents were willing to help me in every way they could. Uh, financially to uh, to fulfill that dream. Did you feel any kind of pressure because you were the first in the family? Was there a pressure you felt to really be successful there? Um, oh yeah, I think because it was uh, it was an effort uh, for me to go through college. And I say that less from an academic perspective, but it was an effort from a financial resource perspective. Yes. And, uh, and so the pressure was, don't waste the money you just spent on three credits of college by not doing a good job in this class. Right. Um, or, you know, don't, don't waste your time on some frivolous pursuit if you have a term paper that you need to go do. Uh, so that it, certainly there was that sense of pressure. Uh, and, uh, and there was... Uh, no doubt in my mind that I would finish college. I, I do believe when I uh, told my parents, well, okay, that was great. Now I want to do graduate school. Uh, I think they were like, huh, interesting. You're not ready to just go jump out into the world and, uh, and get a real career job. Uh, I had already been a co-op student, so I had money to support uh, the pursuit of a master's degree, but I was ready to just keep going and get it done. And they stayed very supportive there helped as much as they could financially. Uh, I, I, you know, I think the biggest thing that my parents did, uh, and, and lots of parents, I would do it today for my kids, lots of parents would, but they let me just live at home while I went to college. I went locally. Uh, and so they made sure that all of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs were taken care of. You know, there was food, shelter, uh, clothing, and so forth, so that I could uh, go to the university and do, do my work. Did you feel as though you were missing out not being on campus? Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, I, lots of my friends went off uh, mm -hmm. somewhere to to uh, university. And I uh, know I would see them when they came home for summers or the holidays. And I would hear all about uh, maybe some of their wild stories. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, or their, or their, frater their fraternities and their sororities, which was not something I ever participated in. Uh, so, yeah, there was a bit of that. I mean, we had our own uh, community in uh, the university where I went. And, you know, I had a lot of friends who lived on campus or lived in housing. I had friends who were very much like me, but they came from a different 
part of the state of Florida. And so they were struggling uh, to go through college, pay their way through college, but they also had to cover rent and room and board. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so that actually made me feel grateful again for my parents and for picking a university right there in my town. Uh, but, you know, I had the opportunity uh, in snippets and, you know, in little bites to go visit my friends who were at a bigger uh, four-year university and partake in a, in a weekend here and there and a football game here and there. Uh, nonetheless, when it came time for me to talk about my kids going to college, I very much wanted them to have the opportunity for the traditional go away from home four year experience. The one yeah. I didn't have. Right. Tell me what, what were you aspiring to as a little girl, what you were going to be when you grew up? Did you, you know, you, you're working again to remind our viewers in, in national security. Um, very, you know, apt in math and science. What was your dream to be when you grew up? Well, um, it probably, you know, I certainly didn't know enough to say, oh, this is my dream. I want to go be in the national security apparatus. Right. I, I think I had no idea what that was, unless it was Walter Cronkite reporting the news uh, in the evening. Uh, and, you know, I came from a big Navy town. So there were there were times through that when you're like, oh, well, you go into the Navy and you become a pilot. And often I look back yeah. and say, hmm, if I had not done computer science, maybe I would have done that. Um, I don't know that there were that many women pilots at the time. This was even pre all the tailhook stuff, but but that crossed my mind. I, I never really saw myself. It wasn't, oh, I want to be a doctor or a nurse. I don't think I had that nurturing part in my desire professionally. Um, but I did want to be a professional, you know, that I can tell you, I certainly wanted to be white collar. I wanted to be a professional. I did not want to be a teacher. I did not want to be in healthcare, uh, but did I want to be a computer scientist? Well, in the early days, that was not something that I knew about or that even existed when I was a kid. So absolutely not that, but something, what I enjoyed was math. Uh, so something that was related to, uh, mathematics, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So what was your very first job? Well, babysitting. Does that count? <laughs> sure. Yes. I think we all did that. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, that uh, so uh, that was my first way of making my own money. Uh, babysitting. We lived in a in a circle. And uh, and so as as people moved in, they tended to have younger kids. So it was uh, easy. Uh, to run next door and, and babysit for the kids next door or the kids across the street or whatever and, and do it that way. Uh, like many of your viewers, I'm sure, I did my stint in high school of working part time. I chose to do that at the local pizza joint. Okay. Uh, and just, you know, make sandwiches, run the cash register. I never made pizza. I never baked pizzas. We weren't allowed to touch the oven, but, you know, make pizzas and, <laughs> and stuff uh, and do that. I would say through high school, however, um, my parents were very encouraging. If there was something, you know, I had everything I needed, but if there were things I wanted, um, let's see what was really, really popular when I was in high school, like Lacoste shirts, I saw Lacoste shirts oh or, or something. Yes. If I yes. wanted something like that, it was my responsibility to have a, a way uh, to get that, uh, to get something that was considered uh, not a necessity. And so you worked in order to do that. But at the same time, the commitment was that a job would never come before my academic requirements and my academic studies. It was sort of a clear understanding that school was the top priority. Doing yeah. well in school was the top priority. Uh, and then if you had time and it didn't interfere, you could have some extra gas money by working for it. Yeah. Well, what a great lesson. I mean, you know, it's always interesting to see the comparison between um, children who grow up with perhaps anything and everything they want and those that, you know, have less, but they're learning how to manage in life. And, and something I know about you is that you're fiercely independent. And, you know, I would imagine that your background lended to that in you because, you know, you had to work for things you want, which is 
really life. Do you, do you think that that, you know, benefited you in a way? Um, yeah, I, I suppose and believe it probably did. Uh, I was also the youngest. Uh, and, uh, and so at points in time, you know, uh, uh, both parents were working. So you also learned uh, to take care of, of yourself a little bit, perhaps more mm -hmm. than if you had uh, the consistent perpetual means of a live-in housekeeper or a nanny or an au pair or whatever. That was not something that we had. It was, it was an older sibling who was meant to just make sure you weren't using the stove. <laughs> Right. <laughs> things like that. Um, and uh, and I think it grew, it, you know, it grew a level of independence in me. Uh, I do think that level of independence has just continued to grow over the decades. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's a good thing. It's just a it's just a trait that I have. Uh, but it makes me very resourceful. It makes me very willing to uh, to know that if I want something done, I need to be able to do it myself. Yeah. Whether that is take a vacation or whether that is change out the light fixture in the living room because I don't like the current one, that I need to be able to do those things uh, myself, remove the snow, uh, at times cut the grass, you know, do all those things that you rely on yourself. And I think that makes you stronger, makes you stronger as a person stronger as a parent, stronger as a professional, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly just stronger as a woman. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's it's excellent to have that level of independence. And I think it's something that we should all strive for. Um, really, whether you're a man or a woman, you know, to ultimately, you want to be able to do in your life what you are capable of doing. Um, we're going to go into our first break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about your career. And I would imagine that one of the things that has enabled you to continually move up the ladder um, is your colleagues and perhaps superiors seeing that in you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that when we come back. Stay with us and we'll be back with Jill Singer. There's a moment every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared, shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOP's women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Holly Hedrick. Dr. Hedrick is a pediatric and fetal surgeon at CHOP. She is also co-director of a frontier program that focuses on a rare condition called congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Dr. Hedrick, welcome to Breaking Through. Thank you. What inspired you to pursue a career in surgery? I think it probably started with my father. He was a dentist in a small town, and I was his assistant, you know, putting on the little bib. So I think the first inspiration was definitely my father. Can you tell us what is congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a birth defect that happens very early, around the 11th week of gestation. And the diaphragm, which is really the separation between the chest and the abdomen, it has a defect in it. And this defect allows things that are supposed to be in the abdomen, like the liver, the spleen, the stomach, the intestines, it allows them to move up into the chest. About 85 to 90% of the patients we see with CDH are diagnosed before they are born, and we can plan for it, and they are right here at the time. Why did you decide to specialize in this condition? Ah, early on, this was way back in residency. It was considered an unsolved problem, and so I was involved in preclinical studies and really developed a desire. And so that whole spectrum of the disease and that whole life course was really attractive to me. 
To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, and welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Jill Singer. Jill is Vice President of uh, Defense and National Security with AT&T. And um, Jill, I wanted to, to ask you a question about your prior roles were with GE Aerospace and IBM. And big companies, big organizations. If I were to ask you, what's one lesson you learned in those roles that you took with you to AT&T, what do you think that would be? Uh, both of those roles were uh, quite a while ago. Um, with GE Aerospace, I was technically a government employee paid by the government and then assigned into GE Aerospace. And, uh, you know, I found some of my best mentors while I was there at GE Aerospace. And what I uh, took with me back to government and then now to my current role is just a greater appreciation of how companies support the government and also why they support the government, a big company like GE and its portion of aerospace, which by the way, for your viewers today is probably now inside Lockheed Martin uh, through all of the divestitures and acquisitions. But you know, why companies like that who are part of the American history and the foundation of our nation have a true calling to come in and support the government and what they do. So that, and of course, I think I represent that now where I am at AT and T uh, with uh, with IBM. That was my co-op experience in college. I spent multiple semesters working for IBM. And I would say what IBM did for me more than anything is it solidified my desire to major in computer science and move forward in what today we call an IT environment because I got to experience what I was doing academically for real <laughs> while I was, yeah. you know, still uh, still in college and could have changed my mind and said, oh, no, this is not for me. But it really solidified that at that point, what did I want to be when I grew up? A systems analyst. Uh, and I actually got to work with people who were systems analysts and learn about their job and confirm that it was what I wanted to do, um, all the while making some good money to help pay for college in the future. Yeah, it's a good field. <laughs> it's a great it was field a win-win for sure. I hope IBM thought it was a win too. I'm sure they did. Um, when you is there someone you've you've referenced mentors, you know, and professors? Is there somebody in particular you think of when I ask you, you know, who is someone who believed in you and helped you to um, believe in yourself? Uh, that's a long list. Um, and I feel blessed to have such a long list. And, uh, you know, and you, you need different kinds of mentors or supporters or coaches at different times in your career. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had, you know, I'll just scoot, well, I'll go way back. I'll maybe come a little bit more current and, and not walk you through all of the mentors or people who have positively shaped my professional life. Um, but there was the dean of the College of Business at the University of West Florida was a very early one. Uh, I had the chance to work for him as a typist. Uh, he uh, he was fascinating to me because he was uh, well educated uh, and uh, was in business where I got introduced to things like Fortune magazine. Sounds so simple. But at, at that time in my life, you know, he would say, oh, here are the magazines that came in for this month take the ones that you want and go home and read them. Uh, he also ended up helping me with uh, scholarship dollars to, to based on need to help me get through through college. And he would talk to me about the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, he was just very willing to have, for me, very grown up, very um, mm -hmm. uh, advanced adult conversations in a world that I knew nothing about. So he, he was certainly one. Uh, and I would say simultaneously was one of our professors in the computer science department who spent a lot of time with us. Uh, he was relatively young. So I think spending time with those of us who were still in our uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, he, you know, he would continue to encourage us as we were going through lines of code or this is so long ago 
when we were waiting hours and hours, I mean, six, eight hours for a job to come back from where we had to send it off for computer processing. And he would just encourage us and help us with our coding. And, uh, and, and that was that was really helpful. Um, you know, flash forward through through my career, I mentioned IBM. I mean, I mentioned at IBM and GE Aerospace. You know, at GE Aerospace, there were uh, two gentlemen who spent their careers uh, in the defense industry space. And I worked for both of them while I was there. And uh, they maintained their connection with me and they maintained themselves as um, willing providers of advice and places I could go even when I was back in government to just talk through something happening uh, at work. Uh, and then I would say, finally, uh, one of my uh, later mentors um, who I met in the mid nineties, probably not long after my GE Aerospace time. Uh, he was what we always call the original CIO for the Central Intelligence Agency. It was so long ago that title wasn't around. Uh, and he remained with me uh, for a, a number of years. I, you know, Generally, I always worked for him. And that relationship was one where I felt completely comfortable and confident to tell him when I thought our direction was right and also confident and comfortable to tell him when I thought we had some challenges in our mm -hmm. direction. And he saw that as valuable. Uh, it, it, there's, there's a saying that I haven't always been good at in my career that is speak truth to power in a way they can hear. So the part that I sometimes have failed on is too direct. So maybe not in a way they could hear, but he was one who had, you know, a very, uh, very willing to talk through uh, where I thought things should go or should not go. And now I realize as I just walked through all of these, they were all men. Uh, no, and that was ding, ding, ding in my head. And I thought I had hmm. interesting that hmm. it was and, and, Perhaps that, um, again, is because of the work you do, but was it more impactful, do you think, because this support and belief came from men as opposed to a woman who I think, and I don't know if you agree with this, I think by nature, women are innately uh, kind of cheerleaders and we're, you know, wanting to lift up our um, friend, each other, women, friends, family. Um, so I guess it was it more impactful, do you think? I, you know, I, I am actually going to go with, I believe that there are more numerous examples that were male. So those four came to mind. But if I give it one further thought, there are two very specific women that I worked with through the years who were impactful and in a way beyond cheerleading way but impactful in a teaching, teaching you how the federal budget process worked or teaching you how to really uh, put together a compelling story or compelling briefing to get the decision that you wanted. Uh, so I, um, I, I'm not going to say that it meant more coming from men. I think there were just more men around. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I had equal there was equal impact on me from the women. Okay. Um, okay. So for the viewers who don't, and I don't know exactly, I know your title, but if, if I ask you, what do you do? What is it that you do? Um, okay. Thank you. I, I think it's, if you're not in this space, it probably is not intuitively obvious what, mm -hmm. uh, what we do, but we are the part of at and that faces certain elements within the US federal government where we're trying to support their mission and support what they are doing. And my portion of it happens to be organizations, agencies, and departments that are focused on the security of the nation. So we are sales, operations, execution, delivery for uh, the members of the Department of Defense the members of the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the intelligence community, and certain elements of the White House and the executive office of the president. And, you know, we're bringing 
everybody's like, oh, you sell them phones? Uh, yes, <laughs> we do that. But we also do a whole lot more that is linked and tied to AT&T as the you know, longest standing communications provider within this country. I think we celebrate our 147th birthday soon. And I can tell you that I have been supporting, uh, our organization has been supporting the Department of Defense for all 147 of those years. Um, we have been with the DOD for every uh, military event that has occurred. We have been with the U.S. intelligence community since long before the National Security Act of 1947 that actually created what we call today the CIA. Uh, and we're there helping them be prepared to uh, analyze intelligence for the president or help them move their information around the globe, uh, help them connect their uh, assets wherever they may be uh, to each other. As uh, assets, I mean, like their people they deploy uh, around the world uh, to you know to be able to communicate and uh, once again uh, provide safety to all of us uh, in this nation, whether that is you know safety from uh, a natural event because FEMA is one of our customers, safety from a man-made event, think 9-11 and the response to 9-11, mm -hmm. um, or uh, safety from anything else that might be happening around us. Does that help? Yes, yes. Yeah. It's it, it's so broad. So there's a lot of things yeah. that you um, are managing and covering. I'm curious, do you collaborate with the government and the Department of Defense on better technologies within the communications, telecommunications industry to be better and keep us all safe from that standpoint? Yes, absolutely we do. Um, we are at, at the core of us uh, in this business. I am a federal contractor. And so I am responding to federal uh, requirements and proposals, but we are also a partner to the federal government and going to your uh, request, I would talk about 5G. Now, you probably all have your mobile phone mm -hmm. and you know that there was 2G, 3G, 4G, and now we're on the fifth generation of uh, wireless communications approaches. There'll be another one. So let's just say and next G. But 5G really is a game changer in its uh, capability, capacity, scale, uh, precision and so forth. The easiest way that I could say is it's sort of like having a your cloud computing platform in your pocket when you have 5G. So we've been working very closely with government on how does this enable enable them to really untether from a fixed wireline connection and go wherever they need to go to serve their mission, but have access to all of the insights, the data, the applications, the processing uh, capacity and capability to do their job wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. And in that one, you can take it back to examples in Homeland Security. Uh, they're all over the place, whether, whether they're at a disaster site, I mentioned FEMA, whether they're on the border for immigration support, they don't always have a desk in a fixed That's office that right. they you know, that they plug into. And, and so using 5G, we will innovate with them so that they have even better capabilities to do their job wherever they may be. Which makes me think of the Apple Watch and how incredible it is that what you can access on that tiny little... Um, if you can see it, if you can read it. If you can see it, which is why I don't have one. Um, how much will or does it already AI play a role in the work that you do? Um, I, I would, as a company, I would say we are using machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities. I, I would probably call it more augmented uh, intelligence to help us with uh, reductions in uh, mean time to repair if an outage happens. And, you know, an outage these days is very, very rare where many, many nines of availability, but sometimes uh, an earthquake <laughs> might actually sever the physical cables or whatnot. So we use it to help with prediction and analysis of where we might have an outage. 
Uh, we use it to help with things that may seem more mundane. We do have a lot of trucks and a lot of technicians. And how do we ensure that they are maximizing their, uh, their efficiency, as well as minimizing the use of excess resources, whether that's gasoline or just hours in a day uh, to get all of the jobs uh, done. For our government customers, there is keen interest in uh, AI, artificial intelligence, in machine learning, uh, in uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And generally speaking, I'd say for us, our experiences have been where their connectivity, you know, where the, if you're testing a set of uh, virtual reality goggles on a soldier to create a more immersive training experience for that soldier, uh, then we're the, we're the support to get the signal from that soldier's eyewear to wherever it needs to go okay. and to get the training experience down into that soldier's eyewear. Hmm. We're now, I think we're all just beginning in this journey. Uh, I would imagine. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I have a question from a listener. I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but I'm going to ask it. What is the biggest security threat and vulnerability for AT&T today? Um, it, you know, I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to pinpoint one. And I'm not in our chief security office. They're best to answer it. So I'm going to genericize uh, an answer and say, I am not speaking on behalf of AT&T when I say this, um, uh, nor am I putting out any kind of an official statement. Uh, we, we worry about cyber. We worry about cyber threats a lot. Uh, we worry about cyber intrusions to intellectual property. That is AT&T. You know, we worry about uh, cyber that would disrupt our customers. And there are millions and millions and millions of customers and businesses who rely on us. And so making sure that what we deliver to them is safe and worry free is tops for us. Uh, I think we, you know, uh, also, I would say uh, our customers demand and should expect that the network you're using, whether it's a physical wire network or a virtual wireless network, that you expect your network to be the first line of defense in keeping you safe. And we do too. Yeah. My last question, we're almost out of time. You're a mother. Yes. And I wonder, what do you worry most about for your children <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the world we live in today? What keeps you up at night when you're thinking about them? And, and you know, what worries you? Um, oh, so much. Um, you know, I, I worry about all these new technologies and how they might be used against humankind or how they might be used in nefarious ways. Excuse me one moment. Yes. Have a sip. I will too. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Um, uh, and they're going to see so much more of it, uh, in their lifetime, uh, than, than I will. And when you look back at my lifetime and how many technologies have been introduced, it's uh, it's like a drop in the bucket compared to what they will experience with technologies. <coughs> I hope you can. Um, when no, uh, is, no it, it, that what is coming is overwhelming to just imagine, I think sometimes. So I think that the best we can do is just take, you know, it's a cliche, take one day at a time, but truly to try to imagine what is coming 10, 20, 30 years down the road for our children is, is can be frightening, very frightening. You know, will it really be like the Jetsons? If anybody remembers the Jetsons? Of and, course, yes. And that seems so carefree and simple mm -hmm. that you would fly to work and your robot would clean your house and make your dinner. Maybe <laughs> my kids will, will get that experience. Um, but I also just hope that my kids will be safe and be actually a little bit judgmental about the technologies as they come along. Mm -hmm. Think a little bit more before they just use them. Yeah. And I would say the TikTok adoption, 
tells me that's not going to happen. <laughs> that, you know, they just adopted TikTok without really asking themselves, what are the downsides of these technologies? Yeah. And I, I, you know, I worry that the generation coming up has not spent enough time thinking about the downsides of all these technologies, the risks associated with them. So I hope that my kids will become more adult there. <laughs> yeah, discerning. It's it's yeah. a good question. Um, well, listen, Jill, I thank you so much for, for being on the show this week. And the work you're doing is fascinating. And I appreciate your candor in sharing um, your personal story as well. Just thank you very much. Uh, you really put me on a thought-provoking journey by asking me to look backwards in order to uh, to look forward. And it's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into our break and you'll hear from one of our watch team members and we'll be right back. We are CHOP, and we can't wait to show you around. We're the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center, we have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome to the Lifestyle Segment of Women to Watch. I'm Carrie Morrison. Today I have the pleasure of introducing the author of Who We Are Now and Corporate Nomad, Michelle Fishburn. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Hi, thank you for having me on, Sherry. Oh, it's my pleasure. Michelle, you're originally from Princeton, New Jersey, and you're currently considered a corporate nomad. When you're not roaming and playing, you settle in North Carolina. Please tell us a little bit about where it all started and your education. Well, it all started, yes, growing up in New Jersey, and then I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and then on to UVA Law School, and I was an international trade attorney in Washington, D.C. for a decade, and I had 
an entire closet of black tie dresses, and that relates to what happened to me. Then I moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, raised my kids for 20 years as a stay-at-home mom and a homeschool mom. And then in 2020, I found myself without a job. I had gone back to doing a part-time job, doing national nonprofit. And now instead of having an entire closet full of black tie dresses, I have a tiny closet full of denim in my motorhome in which I live full time. <laughs> That's fantastic. No iron needed, no dry cleaning. <laughs> Wonderful true. for the environment. <laughs> yes. So you decided to, in 2020, to write the book, Who We Are Now. So I'm going to turn the tables a bit so everyone understands how you've pivoted in the last few years. And the basic question you used to write this book, because as I learned very quickly in our previous conversation, it is quite effective. So the question is, on mm -hmm. January 1st, 2020, what was your 2020 supposed to be like and what did it end up being? Uh, starting with January 1st, 2020, I was really loving my job. I was working as a public relations and national partnerships person for the Brian Hamilton Foundation and Inmates to Entrepreneurs. And we help people learn how to start small businesses. Sometimes when you come out with a criminal record, you don't get a second chance and you really need to learn some entrepreneurial skills. So that's what I was doing. I was very excited. I was working with the, with the Hill, the Senate and the House for Second Chance Month events. We were talking to John Legend's people about going into a prison with him and talking about entrepreneurship education in August when he was on tour and then COVID. And so I got laid off. I mean, it was a foundation. Why pay for somebody who can't do your national events for you? So I got laid off and I thought, no problem. I submitted 86 customized cover letters between the middle of March and the middle of July. And I ended up with nothing. I even offered my services for free and nobody wanted me, um, which was kind of a comeuppance for somebody who thought that they had a lot to give to the world. And so on July 31st, uh, moved out of the post-divorce house that the lease was up. And on August 1st, I had no house, no spouse, and my youngest was going off to college. So I had no kid underfoot. I was completely lost. <laughs> then, then I moved into my 2006 motorhome, which I had road schooled my kids in while I was homeschooling them once for 10 months and then once for four months. And I thought, well, okay, well, I'm living in my motorhome. What am I going to do? And I thought, well, I could go to the beach and consult, but that was probably not going to work. And what's the point of waking up in paradise every day if you are terrified? And right. so I just started doing a run forest run thing. And I drove all over the United States, 12,000 miles, interviewing strangers about the lives during the pandemic. And now it's a book called... Who we are now, stories of what Americans lost and found during the COVID-19 pandemic. A great story. So uh, going back a little bit, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned you were a third generation full-time motor homer. Um, your parents, your grandparents, and now you, even before 2020, as you just mentioned, took to the road. You road schooled your children, which must have been an amazing experience. And I would imagine the best geography, history, and life lessons yeah. anyone can imagine. Why, why did you decide to give this a try? The, I Fortunately for me, driving from North Carolina to Yellowstone is no big deal. I've done it so many times before. So when um, I, I really just didn't have a choice, since I couldn't find a job, it didn't make any sense to rent a place um, and, because I didn't know where I was going to have to go for a job. And so the only thing that made sense was to move in to the 2006 motorhome, but because of my experience and my grandparents, it wasn't scary. And I was able to just go ahead and do what I was already comfortable with, was which was get behind the wheel and start driving west. <laughs> Fun. Did your children ever voice if they preferred road schooling versus attending a standard school? They said they'll never forget the big adventures and they learned so much and we got to do it in tandem with my parents. Uh, once for 10 months and once for four months. And the intergenerational learning and experiences were priceless. I, I can only imagine. And ingrained in your brain. Just, yeah. just wild. 
So you interviewed while you were on the road in 2020. Um, you interviewed and you photographed 100 people for your book, Who We Are Now. How did you decide who to interview and how did you decide whether to turn right or left when you started out each day? It was really messy when I started because, you know, when John Steinbeck went out and did Travels with Charlie in 1960, the country was just hopping with people. I mean, they were everywhere. And I don't know why I thought I was going to be able to interview strangers when nobody was out. Like, how do you do that? So I got out there and I, I started approaching strangers and they thought that I was literally insane probably and so then i started sending emails to museums and different organizations saying hey i'm coming to your town can i interview somebody and it all those i figured it all out though in pine bluffs wyoming which is that find a connector in a town find somebody who knows a lot of other people and so in pine bluffs wyoming i interviewed sonia who's in charge of park rec they had a huge kite festival something that the east coast couldn't do and she put me in touch with Chad, who made 5,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, and Carrie, who had a stunt dog show that she couldn't do all over the world, so she did it for their rodeo. You know, it just, you connect with one person, and they, they help you meet everybody else. It's a whole network. So who were some of your favorite interviews? Oh, my goodness. Well, Christina Wong, who was an L.A. comedian who then turned to leading an organization made, that made 350,000 face masks for vulnerable communities all over the country. She then ended up doing a one woman show off Broadway and recently was named a Pulitzer Prize finalist for drama. And the Doris Duke Artist Award was just given to her for $550,000 unrestricted cash. I mean, wow. talk about somebody who had could not do anything because she was a comedian stuck in her place in L.A. to that is just unbelievable. That's amazing. Um, did you did you run into anyone who didn't seem affected by the pandemic? A lot of people, actually, um, out in the um, in the middle uh, a part of our country and in the west part of our country where there's so much land. I met an, a gentleman named Calvin in Texas between Alpine and Marfa, and he said to me, you know, I feel really badly. Things are good for us. I worry about the New York City restaurant owners and the Philadelphia City restaurant owners. And I said, well, you know what? I just interviewed a guy from New York City who owns a restaurant named Dominic two days ago, and he is taking a financial bath. He cannot have people still in his restaurant. And Calvin said to me, if you ever talk to him again, would you tell him that a rancher in Texas is thinking about him? And so, I, of course, I called Dominic immediately and I said, I want you to know a rancher in Texas is thinking about you. I think that's what a lot of us did was during the pandemic pause, we really did think about each other. We really paused and thought, I wonder how the people in 40 story buildings are doing. I wonder how the person who is a mom and trying to do a full time job and has kids at home doing online learning, how she, I wonder how she's doing. We all really thought about each other. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. What do, what do you think are some of the good things that came out of the pandemic? Well, I think a lot of people figured out different um, avenues, particularly businesses, to, con to even expand what they were doing. So, for example, there is a ballet company in Yuma, Arizona, that one of their biggest dilemmas each year is when they, pr when they produce a nutcracker or whatever, they have to go to a school auditorium and they can only have a certain number of people, which means they had to pick which class in the school gets to see it. Well, because of the pandemic, they bought this huge mat and they had the nutcracker out in a football field. And so <laughs> now they don't have to choose which class gets to see the ballet performances because they can do it in a parking lot, a field or a football stadium. That was a great idea. Yeah. So what's, what's next for Michelle Fishburne? Well, the next book. So I plan to do four more Who We Are Now books on different subjects. And as you can probably tell, I'm in my motorhome. Let me see. There's my bedroom, <laughs> my kitchen, my shower, my refrigerator. So I'll be just wandering around in the motorhome and then when need be, get on a plane and continue to gather stories and share them out so you all can get a sense of what it's like to be those people. Uh, what a what a great path you've taken. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your stories and keep up the great work in, in introducing us to new people with new lifestyles. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure.
For more information about Michelle Fishburn, some of her interviews, and purchasing her book, Who We Are Now, go to www.whowearenow.us or Who We Are Now may be purchased on Amazon. Thank you again for joining us. Sue will be right back to close out the show. Lady, keep living your dreams. Action News, celebrating 50 years with AccuWeather. Over the last five decades, our winters have been getting warmer due to climate change. In Philadelphia, our average winter temperature is up five degrees. And we're breaking more record highs than lows. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers, go for the cheers, go for the hit and the hits, go for the stakes and the stakes, go to get your parlay on, go to get your party on, go for the scene, go for the screens, go for the gallery, go for the win, go to ocean, visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. There's a moment every hour every day every week these moments shape our world they add color perspective and sometimes pain moments are meant to be shared shared by friends family people you trust at action news we cherish every moment and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world never miss a moment trust the people at action news do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amount of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in to another week of Women to Watch. Uh, a big thank you, as always, to Katiri for producing the show and all of our watch team members for their contributions and their segments. Um, next week, I'm going to be speaking with Beth Peretta. Beth is the owner and CEO of Peretta Autosport, um, a car racing team. Um, I believe she was one of the first women to do that. For all things Women to Watch, go to womentowatch.net. That's women, the number two, watch.net, N-E-T. Have a great week, everyone. Now, the Women to Watch, Military Watch. Hi, I'm Sean Casey, Senior Director of Military and Veteran Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. The Navy Reserve recently celebrated its 108th birthday. Formed in 1915 at the outbreak of World War I, the Navy Reserve continues to proudly live up to its motto of honor, courage, and commitment. These words, these values, for each sailor to live up to also have a special link to Women's History Month and advancing equality within the military. In 1942, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, or WAVES, became a division of the U.S. Navy Reserve. This force opened opportunities for women to serve in several fields, including aviation, medical professions, communications, intelligence, and science and technology. However, waves remained closed to black women. And it wasn't until 1944, and after the urging from civic, religious, and civil rights organizations that the U.S. Navy permitted black women to join waves. Soon after, Harriet Ida Pickens and Frances Wills graduated from the Navy Reserve Midshipman School and became the U.S. Navy's first black female officers. Pickens was the daughter of William Pickens, one of the founders of the NAACP, who encouraged her to join the organization. She would go on to lead physical fitness training at Hunter Naval Training Station. Wills, a social worker, didn't have a brother to serve in the military, so she felt it was her duty to represent her family in the war effort. 
Wills would go on to teach naval history to incoming recruits and then return to her social work counseling veterans struggling with the horrors of war. These women exemplified the epitome of honor, courage, and commitment. Their willingness to dive into so many unknowns for the greater purpose of service to others is incredibly inspiring. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Harriet. And happy birthday, Navy Reserve. <laughs>